Welcome to It's All Your Fault on True Story FM, the one and only podcast dedicated to helping you identify and deal with the most challenging human interactions, those involving someone with a high conflict personality. I'm Megan Hunter, and I'm here with my co-host, Bill Eddy. Hi, everybody. We are the co-founders of the High Conflict Institute based in San Diego, California, where we provide training, consulting, coaching, and methods and programs and classes all to do with high conflict. In today's episode, we are in our third installment of the World of Bullies uh, series. And today it's all about bullies and families. We'll break down one family story from a listener and see if a bully is involved and what we can do about it. But first, let's uh, have a couple of notes. Send your high conflict related questions to podcast at highconflictinstitute.com or on our website at highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast, where you'll also find all the show notes and links. So, Bill, we've talked for a couple of weeks about bullies and your brand new book, Our New World of Adult Bullies. I just got my copy last night, <laughs> so it's very exciting. It's just fun to look at the cover. What? Tell us about this cover. Well, the cover, there's a story. The cover tells the story. You see the little fish on the right being chased by the bully fish, but all the other little fish got together and put together, they look like a bigger fish. And they've come up and they've scared the bully and the little fish is getting away. And so that's really the fundamental message is we often have to get help to set limits on the bully. And we can. And we can. There's more of us than there are bullies. And it's to get the best out of bullies while restraining their bad behavior. Excellent. 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 So this bully, this uh, one little fish down here can be a bully in a family. This this probably happens a lot because, and I would think that a lot of bullies in families are hidden. Is that true? Yes. And one of the things throughout I found is bullying is mostly hidden. And so the examples I've used, many of them were public examples, as well as some cases that I had that are disguised. People don't realize how much bullying is going on because it's hidden. And families may be where there's the most because families can the most easily hide it. Yeah. And I think in families, too, that the family becomes so used to it. It's just so normalized and a part of their everyday life that they don't even recognize it as bullying. You know, so they're probably feeling, you know, low self-esteem and disempowered and just think it's normal. Is that normal, Bill? That's very common. The whole family adjusts. And that's one thing I learned as a family counselor is that families work as a system. And so if someone in the family, say, has a disease, they're sick with, you know, cancer or something, the whole family reorganizes around that person. Well, if someone's a bully, the whole family reorganizes around that person. And there's been a lot of research, like in the alcoholic family, if someone's an alcoholic and the roles people play. But bullying is really significant. And especially since the pandemic, um, it's gotten worse because people are taking out their frustrations inside their family because they couldn't go anywhere else for a couple of years. But now that's still continuing to some extent. Ah, wow. That yeah, really brings up a potent point, right? During the pandemic, if you're in a, a family with a bully and you're locked down with that person, that was probably a pretty rough time. Absolutely. And, and we know domestic violence went up during the pandemic and people couldn't leave. The bully didn't go to work. The victim didn't go to work. And so people are kind of trapped with each other. And I was getting requests to write articles. How do you cope with a domestic violence perpetrator if you can't leave them? And I don't like to teach people how to do that. I gave some tips, but ultimately it's safest to be able to get away. So families are hard and for kids even harder because they don't really have other places to go. Right, right. I think the pandemic really put the final <laughs> nail in the coffin, so to speak, of, of many marriages 
particularly those that, that did involve a bully or, um, you know, maybe other situations, uh, d- depending on the role in the family. But I've heard of so many divorces that were blamed, you know, the people involved in them blamed the pandemic for uh, and being locked down with a bully for the, the divorce. The target of blame um, that we talk a lot about on this this uh, show is is the person who gets targeted by someone whose pattern it is to blame others for everything or just about everything. I would think with a bully, is it common for them to have a target of blame? And if so, is it the weakest, most vulnerable person that is the target or would it be, is it equal opportunity? My belief from everything, my my practice experience as a therapist, lawyer, mediator, as well as what I read, is that bullies try out bullying on everybody, that they don't really discriminate at first, but then certain people kind of succumb to the bully. And so in a way, it may be the least assertive person, the most distraught person that bullies don't bother where there's a lot of pushback because they want to dominate somebody. That's the theme. They want to dominate or destroy another person or their reputation. And so to fulfill that theme, they can't do that with somebody that pushes back as hard as they're pushing. So when people are assertive, now that's different from aggressive where you like try to punch the bully or something. I don't recommend that. But assertive is saying you can't talk to me that way or I'm going to end the conversation. Things like that, as long as it's safe to even say that. But they, they tend to get the, the weakest link. But what's interesting in terms of kids, for example, is they often form an alliance with one of the kids against one another one of the kids, or even with the kids against their spouse. So it's it's not absolute, but I'd say tendency is to pick on the weakest link. Makes sense. It makes sense. So we have a, a story from a listener. I'll read it here and get your take on it. Is there a bully? Is there a pattern? Um, And then we'll talk about what to do with it after we take a break. So my sister lives with her parents, and as they've aged, she's become their caregiver. She handles their shopping, shopping, medication dispensing, food preparation, house cleaning, driving, medical appointments, and finances. Even while they were still able to do a lot on their own, they stopped doing those things because she made them stop. And then they just sort of resign themselves to a life of being bossed around by their ongoing child and stop doing the things that they were capable of doing. She spent their limited amount of money um, on cat food for over 100 cats. So they were often left with threats of maybe their electricity being turned off for non-payment and lack of food and things like that. She whined and complained to external family members about their poverty state to get them to feel sorry for her and send money. To the social media world, she posts beautiful pictures of scenery and wonderful quotes from books and thought leaders, always offering to pray for my dear aunt or my sweet, sweet neighbor, while at the same time refusing to let her family, us, her siblings, come into the house and even visit our parents or talk to them on the phone. We believe most of this is because her hoarding had reached untenable levels and refusing to take our our mother to the doctor for her increasingly worsening medical conditions that were life-threatening for over two years because she wouldn't let the home health nurses come to the house to treat the condition. And pretending to be lovely in front of people while we occasionally walk up to the door and unexpectedly we can hear her berating our nearly 90-year-old parents. She tells everyone who will listen that she's such the victim and they all think she's a saint, mostly because she also has physical disabilities. I financially supported my parents and my siblings have as well and supported our sister for decades and sorted out all of their many, many crises. She lies and lies and lies and lies and people just believe her, asking for zero proof to back up her lies. She has even tried to turn our own grandchildren, her great nieces and nephews against us, their parents and aunts and uncles, and has succeeded in turning siblings against each other. She laughs if I bring anything up and mocks me. There's no reasoning. 
I've walked away from the whole mess, but feel awful that my parents are living unprotected from this bully. But I see no alternative. Are there any? So, Bill, bullying, <laughs> I guess it's rather obvious. Uh, but, you know, what you wrote in your book about all the powers of, of bullies, what do you hear in there? What, what powers are happening here, if there are any? Yeah. No, I put in 10 powers of bullies, and I, I hear several in there. And what I have to say is I can't believe how many stories like this I've heard in the last couple of years. As you're writing the book, people are telling you these stories? Well, partly with writing the book and partly just I do a lot of consultation and family. It used to be mostly divorcing spouses, but now it's not. It's that, but also more um, with elderly parents and competition among siblings. And if there's a bully in the family, it might be one of the elderly parents or it might be one of the siblings. You're hearing these things. So the first thing I want to point out really is the isolation, that there really is an effort to isolate the targets or victims and to keep everybody else out so that they're isolated. One of the powers, I say, is emotional repetition. That's the heading for a chapter, the power of emotional repetition, but in isolation. In isolation, people's self-esteem go down. So the victim's self-esteem go down. Their ability to be assertive, which I said at the beginning people should be, just vanishes. And it's like this in many cases, like this in domestic violence cases, child abuse cases, parental alienation cases, as the targets of this just get weaker and weaker. And everyone goes, why don't you just get out, you know? Well, especially elderly people, physically it's harder to just get out of the situation. But over time, emotionally, they get worn down. So this this borders on or is elder abuse, and that's one big area of bullying. But another is the playing the victim. And I have a chapter on that, projection and playing the victim. And we see bullies doing that a lot, and that gets them, other people, to feel sympathetic for them. And that's another chapter is the other people become negative advocates. So there's all these what I call hidden dynamics that are hidden in plain sight once you know about them. You say, okay, where's the negative advocates? Who are the negative? There they are. Okay, how's the isolation going? Yep, there it is. How about playing the victim? Yep. And telling the world how wonderful I am. I'm a hero. That's the bully's story. Is There's a terrible crisis. There's there's terrible people, either other people or the people themselves, and then I'm the hero. And they teach the world they're the hero, and the world goes, oh, wow, what a good person taking care of her elderly parents without knowing the story. So we've got, what about five or six boxes checked here? So definitely you have a pattern, and the pattern's not good, and the pattern often is progressive, so that they're sense of self, the parents, goes down and goes down unless somebody intervenes and people are stuck and trapped. And so many stories like this today. Yeah, it's very sad. And uh, there was more to this story here. I'll read the rest. In our case, a medical caregiver eventually uh, in, did intervene, like you were just saying, Bill, and uh, reported this whole situation to uh, adult Protective Services, where it was investigated. However, this person, the sister, was able to get the Adult Protective Services worker to completely be on her side. So is that a negative advocate, Bill? Yes, that's what happens. People get emotionally hooked, and bullies are good at persuading people. That's where I get the bully story. There's a crisis, there's an evil villain, and I'm the superhero. That can be very persuasive if they can control all the information and they pour on the charm. And that's one of the, the characteristics of, of bullies is that they can be very charming in public 
while they're very bullying in private. So often people don't know. You know, they don't know what's happening with their neighbors because they're always so friendly. Hi in the morning. How you doing? And you find out, you know, they've got like they're holding teenage girls hostage in their basement. Right. You know, there was that case in Cleveland, I think it was. And who knows? But what's sad is that even a lot of professionals aren't really able to to look for these contradictions and and to probe and ask questions and to expect that there's bullies out there and they're going to try to con you. And it sounds like they convinced the APS person that maybe everything's okay or that this is the protective person. Right, right. So we have that uh, APS person then becoming a negative advocate and then, you know, the bully you know, continues to wreak havoc sometimes, to, and it doesn't matter what kind of family situation it is, um, they want to turn people against their target of blame, <laughs> right? Um, and so that can be really difficult and isolating for anyone who is being targeted by a bully. Yeah. And one thing I think you kind of hinted at is that the target of the bullying may be like like the parents but also other siblings who may be starting to speak up and show concern, neighbors. And so they be also become targets. And especially if they're dealing with professionals like Adult Protective Services, they may say, and, you know, my sister, you got to make sure, you know, if you talk to her, she's going to just lie through her teeth to you. She's really dangerous. I think she's a sociopath. You know, don't don't listen to her, whatever she says. She hates me. So don't believe a thing she says. And so they set up the person to come in mistrustful of people who really do want to help and who really are honest. And so they create this kind of little universe that's upside down. And it sounds, this story sounds like it has that. And many of the stories I hear have that. And and it's very tricky. Yeah, it's tricky and it's very sad. Like you said earlier, just very sad. So let's take a quick break. And then when we come back, we'll talk about the bully as a gatekeeper (laughs) Um, and children being bullied. So we'll be right back. All right, we are back and we're going to talk more about uh, bullies as gatekeepers to children, to elderly parents, to, you know, other family members, maybe to financial information, a lot of different things. So, Bill, do is this common, the bully being the gatekeeper? And, and maybe explain, if you would, first what a gatekeeper is. Sure. And yes, it is very common. This is one of the key things that bullies do to isolate. So gatekeepers are kind of stand in between, and especially in families, they stand between people who should be able to have a direct relationship. It's like in the alcoholic family, let's say dad's the alcoholic and mom's the codependent, and mom says to the kids, you know, don't talk to your father, talk to me, go through me, and says to dad, don't talk to the kids, go through me. Well, actually, this is a team then, because then the gatekeeper is the codependent. But in many cases, the bully in the family tries to control information. So like in a parental alienation case, in a divorcing family, the one parent's a gatekeeper to the children and says, dad can't see the children unless he jumps through these three hoops. and Or mom can't see the children, dad says, if he's the gatekeeper, unless they jump through these hoops. But as you also said, financial. So even intact families, you may have a bully who wants no information to leak out. I'll, I'll give you an example. I think of of an intact family with domestic violence where the husband was the, actually the victim. And the wife would occasionally be assaultive, and he was a fairly meek person, but she controlled all the finances. He had no idea. He came to my office to quietly find out about divorce, what you have to do. And I said, well, gather all the accounts and get the account numbers and banks and take pictures of account statements. He says, I don't know where they are, and I don't know what they are. 
and I'm sure she's hidden stuff far away. He was just really helpless about financial information. So you you get bullies this way. And when you think about elder abuse, like the, the example you started out with, we see financial control, uh, family control, controlling the household. Wherever one person can control another person's life, bullies might might slip in. And that's why I want everybody to be aware of this. There's bullies out there, maybe 5 to 10% of people. You just don't realize it. So have your eyes open. Notice these kinds of patterns. Is somebody isolated? Is somebody being victimized? And if they are being victimized, if they are being isolated, and, and we do finally get our eyes open, then then how, what do you do? Because, you know, in so many cases, uh, because of the isolation, it's, it's hard to do anything or to even know about it. But let's say you do know about it. And what leverage do you have? A lot of people are afraid to, number one, stand up to a bully for whatever that means. And number two, there are just some cases where you just don't really have any leverage if you can't get people to believe you that the, that really, you know, true bullying is going on. What has to happen, it's like the picture on the cover of the book. You've got to go to other people. And it may be if you're a sibling and you've got, let's say, four other siblings and one of them's the bully controlling the parents, is go to the other siblings and give each other support to intervene. Or go to professionals, have a consultation with a therapist or a lawyer and find out what are my options here. What's really interesting is there's some terrible situations that people have tried to expose and had trouble and end up in the news. I did a lot of reading of news articles in writing my book. And there's so many situations where there's like a dozen people covering up and justifying, but a journalist exposed the story. And now they're getting attention and suddenly, you know, a whole division of a government agency might be exposed as colluding with a bully or just being incompetent and not recognizing this is a bully situation. That's one reason I always teach professionals. You always have to have three theories of the case. What you're being told might be true, but what you're being told might not be true at all or maybe partially true. And if you don't always think about that, when someone tells you there's a crisis or a person in trouble, you may be on the wrong side, on the wrong team and helping someone get hurt and bullied rather than helping someone that needs help. And that's a tragedy. It's a true tragedy because because so many are being marginalized and it's, it's very disempowering and um, the opposite of having a fulfilling life, right? And um, so, yeah, you just have to check things out. Always check out whether this could be true, might not be true. So let's switch now to children being bullied. Can um, children be bullied or do we call it abuse or is it both? Are they the same? Well, bullying and abuse are pretty much the same thing. Child abuse, domestic violence, bar fights, you know, if somebody's really harming another person is bullying. I think we think of abuse with certain categories of bullying that have become familiar and repetitive. So we think of child abuse, could be hitting the child, could be sexually abusing a child, could be neglecting a child. So they're starving. They're not, they're not getting fed. And emotional abuse. In all of those situations, it's bullying. Somebody's harming a child. And it's a pattern. And that's the thing with bullying. It's a pattern. It's an unequal relationship that's being taken advantage of. And so, yes, children are one of the prime people that are bullied because they're smaller, they're physically smaller, they don't know how the world works, they don't have resources outside their family. So children children are some of the people that are most abused, and no one knows in some cases. It's so, you know, soul-destroying to think of, of that, that the 
in families, the people that are supposed to love each other, right, and particularly love their children and protect their children are sometimes the biggest monsters. Um, just over the weekend, I was reading some adoption stories and, there, you know, people who were put in a cage and fed dog food and things like that. So we, you know, there, there's different levels of bullying. And like you said, and to get to that level, like how, who, how, how does this happen? It happens, first of all, because there's bullies and bullies have a drive to dominate or destroy other people to create win-lose relationships. And my theory is that bullies are an ancient personality that's still part of our personality gene pool because it has succeeded in different times and places. And some people are born this way. Antisocial bullies, antisocial personality disorder is the most genetic one of the 10 personality disorders. So people are off, often born with it, and they really are born without a conscience and don't develop it. Part of that's why, but also people were abused as kids, and now as adults, they abuse their kids and other personalities, uh, or they were indulged as kids and allowed to get away with harming and picking on other people. So we have to understand those people exist, maybe 5 to 10% of society. And the goal isn't to get rid of them, it's to set limits on their bad behavior because they can contribute. Many have positive things to contribute. So we have to recognize this exists, let's say, you know, five to 10% of families and households. And so we need to have some eyes open. I'm not wanting to teach people to spy on their neighbors like they do in China um, or did. Well, maybe they are again, I'm not sure. <laughs> but but you know, you get a, a repressive culture where everyone's spying on each other. That's not the answer. The answer is to just have an awareness. So if something comes to your attention that sounds strange, that you don't discount it and that you don't believe everything that people tell you. I would say we shouldn't believe anybody more than 95%, even ourselves, because we never know when our brains are playing tricks on us and want us to like someone we shouldn't like or dislike someone we should like. So I think a lot of it is just a lack of awareness by outsiders and bullies getting away with it because they, they have control of their children. But another thing I want to add is we have smaller families now. And so when there's only one or two children and maybe parents are separated, families are much more able to hide abusive behavior than when people had four and eight and 12 kids and aunts and uncles lived in the house. <laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah, interesting. So I guess to kind of wrap this up, you know, it's, it's sad, but if you're in a family and you're being bullied, there are a lot of resources. We'll have some of those in the links and the show notes. If you're confused, if you're feeling down about it, you know, and let's say you're on the outside, uh, try to connect those dots. Don't just believe everything you're told. <laughs> if you're confused about something, that might be a yellow flag or even a red flag that's meant to be explored a bit further. So, um, you know, medical professionals, adult, adult protective services, child protective services, you know, everyone needs to be trained. And I'm sure there's a lot of training out there, but uh, it's important to understand this. Let me add, and I put this in the book too, is there's a lot of examples of bullies getting stopped. And in my book, I have more examples of bullies getting stopped than bullies getting away forever with their behavior. So it is possible. I want to give people hope. And just because child protective services and adult protective services exist is a good sign because we didn't have that like 30 years ago or, or 60 years ago. And so there's a lot of hope, but people do need to be much more educated. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's that's so important. It's not hopeless, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> we can be hopeful. So thank you. So next week, we will talk about bullies as leaders um, in companies and other organizations and um, 
for-profit and not-for-profit. In the meantime, send your questions to podcast at highconflictinstitute.com or submit them to highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast. We'd love it if you tell your friends about us, your colleagues, and give us a thumbs up or a like somewhere, wherever you're listening to this. And uh, keep learning and practicing skills. Be kind to yourself and others. Set a lot of limits when necessary. And uh, we'll all try to keep finding the missing piece and keep the conflict small. It's All Your Fault is a production of True Story FM. Engineering by Andy Nelson. Music by Wolf Samuels, John Coggins, and Ziv Moran. Find the show, show notes, and transcripts at truestory.fm or highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. Mm-hmm.